Welcome to another episode on the JBK Show. On this week's episode, we've got a huge guest, none other than Australian boxer, brother of the famous Tim Zhu, but carving out his own path, Nikita Zhu. You've got a fight coming up next week. Happy to get you into the studio. Nikita, how's the body feeling? Honestly, the body's feeling pretty good. It's um, not too sore, it's not too drained, and just getting ready. You're not wearing big... Big sweatshop jumpers where you're trying to lose as much sweat as possible. Yeah, I mean, we're a week um, out. Sweatsuits, they come in <clears> when <throat> things are a little bit like bad at the last couple of days, but I try and avoid them at all costs. Okay. They're, yeah. they're horrible. <laughs> what weight what are you now and what weight do you have to get to? Um, I got like around four kilos to lose and it's not, not bad. It could be worse. <laughs> uh, we spoke off camera. I'm going to go through the whole the weight cut lead up to the fight. The yeah. saunas. The baths. Let's see if the average person can keep up with a professional boxer when cutting. Lose, yeah, but it's hey, what do you got to get down to? Uh, 69.8. But I try and always get down to 69.45. Like okay. Just have a little bit of extra wiggle room. So if I'm rolling around at 83, let's see if I can get down to about 79 or something like that. Yeah. We'll call it even. I don't know. But, mate, give us a bit of an insight into your past. I mean, you've won six professional fights with, with No Limit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're on a bit of a roll. Yeah, you've been taking wins by TKO. Your two most recent fights have been done in pretty quick fashion. How was it getting back into boxing? You had a bit of time off. Talk us through that. So I went into architecture um, after high school and I kind of gave up on boxing for a bit. I wanted to just focus on my education. My mum always thought that education is the number one thing. I went to a private school, so they invested quite a bit of money into us. Mm. So. She really wanted one, at least one of her children to have a uni university degree. And yeah, I chose architecture. I completed it all. I was really enjoying it. Kind of became, kind of embedded the lifestyle of an architect. Worked in, the architectural f in an architectural firm for a year and really got sick of it. Didn't you enjoy the firm? <laughs> no, it was, I was working in there during COVID, during the mm. second wave of COVID. And just being stuck at home, with a shitty computer, waiting for computer programs to load, sitting there all day, like playing with my thumbs. Yeah. It kind of killed me inside. Meaningless work. Oh, you can only look at CAD drawings for so long. Yeah, you, you feel like a little robot that's just there to just like yeah. plunk numbers in. Oh, especially during isolation, it would have been tough. But I mean, what made you want to get back into boxing? Was it, did it, did it just snap while, while you were sitting behind a computer and said, look, I've got so much more to give, I'm an athlete? What was it? There were, so, there were actually like three or four factors coming in. There was going to one of my brother's fights during COVID that kind of re-sparked the energy inside of me. Um, also just like the whole being under, behind a computer, behind a desk. Mm. It wasn't a very healthy lifestyle. It wasn't healthy for the body. It wasn't healthy for the mind. I got into bad habits of not exercising because I was constantly stuck on the computer. Mm. And I really just wanted to live a healthy lifestyle. And boxing was the place for me because it was the thing that built me up from the past. It was what gave me a foundation of kind of good life skills and life, um, life morals. Mm. So kind of I started doing all my research during my lunch breaks, started trying to figure out a new game plan and yeah, it went from there. Coming from a family of, you know, world champion boxers, mm -hmm. like I said, your father, world champion boxer, Tim's carved out a path for himself. Because mm -hmm. of the success of your family, you know, you didn't have as tough as your, as your parents. Is it harder, like that saying is, it's hard to wake up in the morning in silk sheets? Was it harder to get motivated and get that consistency to get back into boxing? Or were you just that driven to have that change in lifestyle? So the thing is, I didn't need to get back into boxing. I could have had a pretty good life without boxing. Mm. But... It's always felt like something that was in my blood and something that it's like an itch that I always have to scratch. My dad kind of embedded this lifestyle inside of us from an early age when we were forced to go to, for runs every single morning at 5 a.m. So it's kind of all that we knew. Like, although we did kind of wake up in or live in silk sheets, mm. we didn't have an easy childhood. Um, he made it tough on us and 
that's something I really respected about my dad. Yeah, are you thankful for that? Would you yeah. what, would you ever would you pass that down onto the next Zeus? My kids, they're gonna be living kind of in the slums. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna I wanna kinda do a little reverse. My dad put us in silk sheets, I gotta put them back into the dirt. I like it, I like it. You took that time off, so you focused on school, went to university, mm -hmm. and you said you kind of stopped training for a bit. Did you ever lose what you thought maybe had when you were younger? That mo not even motivation, mm. but just skill set or even fitness? Yeah, so actually getting back into the sport was very difficult. The first, I only think I only got the kind of the hang of it after like six months. I went to my first few fights and I still didn't feel in like the condition that I left. Mm. I, w I left at a very good, uh, very good spot winning a Australian title in the amateurs. And yeah, it took a, took a while to kind of get my feet back because the muscle memory, it's there, but access it it's, takes a little bit of work well now you're carving out uh, a really good path for yourself like you're, you're headlining the event mm -hmm. uh, on august 23 with, with no limit um you got a fight up against jack burbaker um and even just in previous fights you're slowly building up that household name that tim is for yourself mm -hmm. what is the feeling like of going out to an arena and knowing that you're the reason why people are here what's that feeling like it's a I feel like a responsibility like there's little kids that come up to me asking for photos and you see the joy in their eyes when they see me and although I feel in my, in my eyes that I don't deserve this kind of attention yet it's still it's a there's like a responsibility that you, that's on your shoulders and there's there's a sense of joy that people coming out to see you people are there to respect you and to support you and I feel like whenever I go into the ring, I have to kind of make the people proud. And how helpful has Tim been you know, on, on your return back and even in your last few fights? Yeah, I know you, the family doesn't like when you guys spar too much together, <laughs> but how helpful has he been in your career so far? With Tim, it's like having a, just a, a library that I can constantly ask any question to. I've actually got one of the greatest teams possible. I have information from my dad's end with my grandfather, my uncle, who were there during my dad's era. Mm. I have my brother who's experiencing it first on and who's doing, doing it very successfully. And I can basically have anything that I want in terms of knowledge and information. He gives me so much advice when, I'm, when he feels that I'm not doing things correctly. I ask him a lot about weight cutting because he's kind of figured that out perfectly. He's got a chef that they work with and they've made the weight cutting process a lot easier. And I noticed that with the last time with my last fight that I really didn't have to kill myself to to make the weight mm. and just using him as a resource was very vital. I know it's probably different now during a preparation for a fight but during off times do you guys mm. train together do you guys you know keep a similar regimen? Yeah, we're, yeah. We, we're always training together no matter what he's always starting maybe like an hour before me so the coach kind of uh, switch, switches up afterwards mm -hmm. but we basically do everything together. Oh, except the morning sessions. We split that up between the two of us. Okay. But when it comes to fights, we're, we, we've also got different schedules. We fight at different times and we have different kind of regimes during the training camps. Different diets as well. Yeah, different diets. <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah. Doesn't, he doesn't like my style of dieting. No, no, he's not into the raw, <laughs> no. the, the raw nature of food. No, but look, you've seen the trajectory that, that Tim's gone on and it's been building up over mm -hmm. time. He's now the WBO champion um, mm -hmm. in his division. Where do you see yourself in five years if you keep on this trajectory, which is pretty similar to Tim's? My, my aim is to do the exact same that he's been doing, just to get a world title, and that's honestly the main goal. After that, we reassess and think of what, what can we do to, to go even further. And uh, like a lot of rugby league fans who, who watch us, we know George Rose mm -hmm. heads up No Limit. What's it like working with, with George Rose and the No Limit Boys. They've become very popular, particularly in Australian boxing. I think they run Australian boxing. It's like how UFC runs combat sports mm. in America. When you think of boxing in Australia, you think of No Limit. Yeah. What's it like dealing with them? So they've kind of got like a little monopoly going and they, <laughs> they control the whole Australian boxing. Mm. But they're generally just great guys. Even before, before I started my, before I had my pro debut and before I was signed with No Limits, we got offers from Matchroom. We got offers from other uh, promotional companies yeah, in Australia. Yeah, they're stand, they're stand yeah. boxing now. And although my manager was kind of still playing along with No Limits, we we always knew that we were going to go with them because I saw the kind of relationship that they had with my brother, mm -hmm. the way that they treated him, and they 
they're like brothers for us. They're, they're just good guys. You can talk to them like, like they're your friends, but when it comes to business, they, they switch on. And, and the way they've handled your brother, it's treated his career pretty well. They've gotten him good mm. fights and they've kind of gotten him in a position to where he's going to probably go fight in America soon, which is good. Yeah, so they've, they've done a lot of great work. Like um, the three brothers, they're, they're, they're amazing. Yeah, no, for sure. Mm. And, and if you ever get yourself down to a No Limit event, they know how to put on a show as well. I'm talking pyro, mm. big entrances. We love to see it. What are you thinking entrance-wise for your upcoming fight next week? I know Tim likes yeah. the biggie smalls and the big <laughs> pyro. Are you a bit more subdued? How do you like your entrances? So it's going to be yeah. similar to the last fight. The okay. Similar vibes to YMCA. Okay. I'm not going to give it away because I just want the fun of it to happen yeah, at the yeah. moment. But it's a little funky. It's just going to be something like a, like a like dancing kind of music. Well, I want to ask, how come you didn't break out into the full YMCA? You gave it, you had a little I bit of a I started dance. a little bit. Yeah, you had a little bit. We were watching it because we were away at the time watching the fights. But it was like, he had the, he had the YMCA going, but I wanted to see the breakout into the, Look, into the full I actually thing. spoke with the whole team before the fight. And it's like, guys, make sure everyone lifts your hands up. <laughs> like I showed them the video clip. No one did it. <laughs> so I was walking backwards. I was looking around like, what are you? <laughs> Come on, guys. You needed my, the think, support. Yeah, I think my granddad lifted his hands up once or twice, <laughs> but no one else would. Well, well let's, let's talk a bit about your upcoming fight. Jack Burbaker, he, he's no slouch. Mm -hmm. He's been in the game before. He's come out and said that he wants to get one back on the family. He lost mm -hmm. in 2019 to your brother, Tim. He's seen your rise um, into stardom with no limit. And now he says he wants to get one back on you guys. Has that kind of played into your thoughts going into the fight? What are your thoughts on Jack, and where do you see the fight going? Look, he might he might want to get one back on us, but I don't I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah, he's a little bit over his head with this. Well, he's only had one fight back to you know to get back into the swing mm. of things. He had a, a long period of time off as well, and I don't know if he sees you as an opponent to try and make a name for himself to kind of make that landmark that he is back into the sport, but. I mean, just looking at him in the press conference, he seems a little bit off. He's, he's not as confident as he once was. Have, mm. have you kind of felt that in the press conferences? Definitely. Like, I came into this prep, ex like, my manager was telling me, expect him to talk, where this is a guy that's going to be very talkative. Mm. He's going to try and get under your skin, but he's done none of that. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> it's kind of been I'm, like a friendly back and forth. Yeah. Not yeah. even. Actually, when I watch the press conference, it's almost like he's preparing to lose. He's, he's self handicapping. <laughs> He's like, you know, I'll put up a good fight. I've got a granite tune. I can test it out. Oh, yeah. but it's just like, he's not really saying he's going to do much damage to you. He's more so just going yeah, to Yeah, so it's weird. He Usually, um, in the past, he's always been talking how, how great he is, how we're not at his level and all this, but he's not doing any of that. I think your maybe. brothers are scared him. How, yeah, how, do you, <laughs> how do you approach the press conferences? Each fighter is different. You know, we had Tony Harrison come mm -hmm. on, on a No Limit card and really show that American style of trash talking. It was hilarious. It was, it was, it was really entertaining <laughs> yeah. to be around. Whereas on the Australian side, we don't have that many colorful characters as they mm. do in America. How do you approach press conferences when you're, when you're going up and, and having a self fight? Is it, it's an aspect that no one really mm. talks about. How yeah. do you approach the trash talking element of press conferences? So for me, I, I buckle under pressure. So <laughs> if I prepare stuff in my head too much, I overthink. I start to sweat, I start to get real nervous mm. because I feel like I have to say these points, da 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 But when the moment comes, things my, my brain goes empty and I forget to say everything and I kind of go blank. So my aim is to not prepare anything at all and just go with the flow. Just say what, what comes to Whatever you. comes into my head, just have zero filter and just blurt it out. Well, that's a way to be most authentic. Yeah. Do, you, do you find that you'd rather just let your, your fight do the talking. I feel like that's what Tim's done throughout the majority of his mm. career. As much as he's been entertaining, and what's my motherfucking name, <laughs> he has let his fight do the talking mm. and, and how he carries himself in the ring. Do you want to do, kind of do the same? Yeah, for me, it's as well. Like, um, we were brought up with a father that didn't do any talking, mm. didn't do any trash talking. So we're not someone that's going to go out and try and talk absolute shit to someone just for the, the sake of selling a fight. But with me, I'm still, I just try and be myself. I want people to, when they watch these press conferences and they see me in real, in real life, they can see, yeah, this is an authentic person. He's exactly the way he is on, on camera that he is in person. Well, how do you think Australia views Nikita Zoo now? <laughs> After six fights and your showings and how you've been in the press conferences and the build up to the fights, how do you think Australia views Nikita Zoo? 
they probably think of me as a pretty weird kid. <laughs> with, well, I mean, there's, the, it's, there's some funny, there's some funny little sound bites from press conferences. Yeah. <coughs> You've been drinking snakes, blood in preparation. <laughs> yeah. You've been talking intimately to some fighters. <laughs> Do you think that's a perception that you have? A bit of like a quirky style of fighter? Yeah, um, and I'm, I'm glad that I have this kind of kind of image mm. because it's who I am. I'm I'm a weird, pretty weird kid. I got maybe a bit of um, a bit of trauma from my childhood. Yeah. Some of the stuff that <laughs> I went through in terms of like with my dad, but yeah, it's just, it's who I am. Well, one of the quotes you said going into this fight was your aim is to pop his virginity and be the first to hurt him. Do you want to maybe elaborate on that? Elaborate on that? I, I, don't, know, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as it, like I started saying the sentence, I was like, oh, fuck, okay, I'll just keep going. You just it. keep going yeah. with it. But I think you did eventuate it and say that you want, you want to get him to quit the sport. Yeah. Do you want, uh, and you've also come out and said, you know, your brother did it in four rounds. You want to do it before that. I gotta, I gotta beat him in something. There you go. He, he beat my first round knockout record with his, with his last fight, and mm. that kind of annoyed me. Like, <laughs> I finally got one up on him, and then he takes it away straight away. So you're not only competing with Jack in the ring, you're actually competing with Tim. Is that extra motivation for you? The motiv the competing with Tim's a thing that we've always done. Everything that we do, we're always competing against each other. That's what kind of helps our our relationship with growth and everything. But yeah, just. Being able to have that little one-up on him will be good. <laughs> well, Jack, your Virginia's about to be taken away from you. It looks like you're going to be out of the sport pretty soon. Going in raw. He's going, he's, yeah, <laughs> Nikita's coming in raw. But look, speaking of your, your past fights, particularly uh, the most recent one, you've already fought twice this year. Mm -hmm. Again, in short order. I mean, TKO, the last fight was in one round. You do all this preparation and, you know, you get it done in one round. Even before that, you did it pretty quickly. You had Bo Beblin in March. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, knockout in the fourth round. Do you feel like you want to spend more time in the ring as you want to gain more experience? Or are you happy to get it done and get out of there, collect the payment and on to the next fight? For the first, like, introductory fights, you want to build the experience. So I'm not too happy with quick round, quick, quick stoppages. Mm. Because you don't, you still, you don't learn that much from it. Um, it's a great feeling, yes. It's a huge adrenaline rush, but in terms of progression in your career, you don't get too much from it. So this is why Jack, I feel like, is a perfect dance partner for me. We get to, he's got a gra granite chin that he says, mm. and I get to really kind of test myself with him. Boxing's at a at a, a time now where. There's a lot of great individual fighters mm -hmm. and, and, and ones that have come before. Do you look at any other fighters for inspiration or is it been solely based on your camp and the traditions that, you know, that your mm -hmm. father had? No, I look, I look outside for external sources. I like the stuff that's going on in America I, with the Crawford Spence stuff. It's, it's, always, it's always interesting to see how other fighters do things, how they approach fights and... I try and always kind of study fighters that I look up to. Crawford, for example, he's a big one that I really look up to. He's just a master at his work. Floyd Mayweather, again, a defensive master. And yeah, it's the whole like all access, being able to see behind the scenes, the stuff that they do behind camp. And it's just, it's interesting to, to learn from them. You've only been fighting for what, a year and a half now since your yeah. first professional fight. Maybe it's an effect of your brother that your last name and you, you're such a household mm -hmm. name in boxing already. What would you say your highlight's been over the first year and a half? Mm. Honestly, every single fight has kind of had the same feeling. It, they're, both, they're all just crazy adrenaline rushes afterwards. They're, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> There's it's no just taking it as a cup. Yeah. But there, there is, I'd imagine there's no feeling like it. Yeah, you know? I, I live kind of every single day, like each individual day. So mm. I can't personally say I've knocked someone out, but it looks fun. <laughs> yeah, it does. It, it, it is a satisfying <laughs> feeling, especially when you see blood coming out of their face. It's like, oh, ha, ha. I did it. that. I did that. <laughs> now, the plan is obviously you get past Jack mm -hmm. within four rounds. <laughs> What's next for Nikita Zook? We got another fight date scheduled, I think, maybe. November, December, end of wow. the year, something like that. So and that'll be what your fourth fight this year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the first few years of your career, you want to be active. You mm -hmm. want to gain the experience. You're still not having these crazy hard fights when you do at the high levels. Usually at the high levels, you have maybe one, one, or, two one, one or two fights a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But at the start, you want to try and get your numbers in, 
trying to get as much experience as possible. So after after this fight, I'll maybe have like a week rest and get back into it. Get go back into go it for camp. another trip to Thailand, have a, another foundational camp out there, work a lot on strength and even maybe learn some other martial arts, just to kind of build up that kind of the archive of information in your head. What's that week's rest look like? What are you doing? I don't know. I Bar Luka burgers and... Oh, easily, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of disrespect to my stomach and my body. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, you um, burnt it. Yeah, but I've also had the idea of maybe going for a drive down to Jindabyne, go do some camping up in the snow with my dogs. Who knows? I don't know. Kind yeah. of whatever comes to my head, I'll kind of go with that. Yeah, and do it. And what's the primary difference of having a camp in Australia and what you see a lot of fighters doing is going over to Thailand mm. and doing those two weeks, one month stints in Thailand. Is it very beneficial as a fighter? And what's the, what's the main differences? The climate there is very tough to work against. It's very humid, very hot. And it's just, just walking around, you start sweating. So it's a very good place to build a, like an engine for yourself, a condi like for conditioning. Mm. They have great facilities there. It's a... It's a country that is very highly connected with martial arts. Muay Thai is a huge thing in Thailand. And Kickboxing. Yeah. yeah. The people, they understand fighters. They understand the lifestyle. So it's a great place to go for that, for that purpose. There's also the, the drinking side of things. There's also the, yeah. stay away from. There's also a lot yeah. of uh, <laughs> elderly Australians that park yeah. up over there and enjoy <laughs> themselves at various different shows. Yeah, but, but it's good because it's kind of segregated a bit. Mm -hmm. There's like areas where it's just for partying, then there's areas that's just for fighting. And when you're over there, mm -hmm. it's strictly business, getting the camp done, and, mm -hmm. and that's it, you, you go on to your fight. Making yourself feel as good as possible. And just, it's also like, it's, although it's a heavy training camp and your body is going through a lot, you're trying to enjoy yourself a little bit as well. You want to try and rest up a bit, just enjoy being away from home, mm. kind of shutting things off and it's kind of like a little meditation. Well, we saw recently the No Limit Brothers. Mm -hmm. They went over to America. <laughs> Looks like they were wheeling and dealing over there. Do you have aspirations to go to America and, and kind of, you know, plant the Australian flag over there? For fighting? Yeah, that's, that's not obviously the main goal. That's my brother's goal at the moment. He's, he's building up a name and he's going for the American fighters. Although they're bringing some of the fighters here, mm -hmm. it's, um, the main plan is to, to go to America because that's where boxing is kind of located. Las it's at its biggest as well. Mm. Yeah, Las Vegas is the capital of boxing in the world. And that's kind of like the, the, the main goal to try and get towards. Yeah, well, speaking of your brother, he recently became the WBO mm -hmm. champion. They stripped it off Jamal Charlo. They will, will be stripping it off. They will be. They yeah. haven't done it just so yet. As soon as he steps into the ring against Canelo, that's when he gets officially stripped. Okay, so there. Okay, yeah. so not just yet, but pretty yeah. much it is but done yeah. because he is a great mm -hmm. to fight Canelo. What was the family's kind of reaction to that, that now Tim is the man in the division? Well, we kind of already knew, knew, knew this was going to happen because as soon as the Canelo fight was announced, it was bound to happen that he's going to get stripped. Mm -hmm. But honestly, ever since he won the Harrison fight, I've just viewed him as a world champion because he did win the interim belt and then Charlo just kept ducking. Do you think he is? He's purposefully ducking? I mean, the Canelo fight is a money fight as well mm -hmm. and, it's, and then Canelo Alvarez no slouch. But it, it does look like he's been actively avoiding Tim. Has he just been there, ducking him and does not want to make that fight? There could be something in his head knowing that he could lose and this is a huge, um, huge risk. Mm -hmm. And he sees the Canelo fight as a huge payday that even if he does lose, he doesn't lose his belts. Mm -hmm. He's able to kind of still fight, still has the, um, it's a safeguard the, other, for him. the other three belts and he's able to then fight Tim afterwards. Do you see the so, fight do you see the fight between him and Tim ever happening? It has to. It has to. If he doesn't, it's such a shame because Tim's he's worked so hard for this. He's kind of for the last year or so it's just been on his mind. Well, I mean Tim's already looking elsewhere. He's mm -hmm. got an upcoming fight pretty much announced with Mendoza. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, there's talks of him wanting to get in the ring with, you know, Spence and Crawford. Mm -hmm. What's next for Tim? Obviously, looking past this Mendoza fight, is he, does he just want to continue 
building up that record and getting over to the States? So yeah, he's not waiting for Charlo. Um, if you wait for opponents, um, you can be waiting for years. And he's staying active. He's doing things by his own schedule. And just, again, building up that name in America, building up that fan base and growing as a, as a business out there. That's how that's how the money's made. Mm -hmm. You gotta you gotta engage with the people. You gotta engage with the sport, and that's how you really build yourself up. I don't know if you've seen recently Logan Paul and Jake Paul have been going at each other on I think on Logan's podcast. Wait, the brothers? Yeah. The brothers, yeah. They've they've sat across from <laughs> each other on a podcast like this. One saying, "I'm the better boxer than you are." They don't they don't see eye to eye. He thinks he's with one of his enemies in KSI. So there's a little bit of conflict between the mm. brothers. So that brings me back to you know <laughs> when I think of brothers boxing, it's obviously you and Tim. Have you guys ever thought maybe down the line for a money fight, you guys might? I, lock I'd heads? say fuck that. Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> um, you don't have it in you to knock him out. Me personally, no. I don't. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know how how well I'd do against him. I've sparred him before, and his punches. Bloody damn hurt. <laughs> well, he does have that little bit of experience yeah. on you, obviously, but who does get the better of each other in sparring? Is it usually him? Yeah, usually him, yeah. Um, well, he's got all the experience. Mm -hmm. You take it easy on him, though. Yeah, I take it easy. <laughs> I, I, I turn down the power by like 50%. <laughs> well, mate, we wish you the best of luck in the fight. It's going to be electric in Sydney mm -hmm. next week. Thank you. You know, we're gonna, we'll are gonna be there getting behind you, dancing to YMCA or whatever you come out to. <laughs> But we do this with every every guest that we have on. It's called fill in the blank. So we're going to put you mm -hmm. on the spot. Three questions. Blank is something. Just give us the answer that comes to mind. Okay? Mm -hmm. Blank is someone you'd love to get in the ring with. I don't know why, but the first name came up to my head was Tim. Tim? <laughs> I guess it was just because. There you go. Okay. So first thing. I'll plant um, the seed. Yeah. God I guess it. we'll see. <laughs> That'd be an Australian money fight if my, we ever get it. My death. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That was just announced. Okay. Blank has been your favorite fight so far. And this can be the way in which you did it, how long it went. Yeah. Um, the most recent one. Mm -hmm. First round knockout. First round knockout, yeah. I got to, got to get it done very quickly and got to get straight to the food. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Quick turnaround. And Blank, in your eyes, is the best boxer of all time. Floyd Mayweather. Floyd Mayweather. Yeah, Mayweather. Why is that? Skill-wise, he's been touched maybe three three four times there's a you can put it you can count on your hand how many times he's been hurt he's perfected the craft to the point where there is no there's been no answers on how to beat him other fighters they've all been beaten and there's always like a way to beat someone and as a person maybe he's not the greatest fighter with Ali having great um great morals and creating a big movement but if we're judging from a skill and a boxing is a sport of hitting and not getting hit. I think it undoubtedly has to be Mayweather. Yeah. And the undefeated record speaks for itself. Uh, I agree. Yeah. And, and his ability to sell fights as well, that not a lot of people Look take at him now. Account. He's like, what, 46? He's still doing exhibitions and completely outclassing guys. <laughs> Although he is fighting like Nobody's. a bunch of spastics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Yeah. It's like but he's doing exhibitions, still making millions and can't get touched. Yeah. You know? He's a. Uh, He's fighting, like, he fought Logan Paul, who's, like, what, 30 pounds? I don't know how much that in kilos, but yeah. you can see the height difference. You can see the size difference, and he still smashed him. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. No, I agree with you. Mm. One of the greatest of all time, for sure. But, again, mate, best of luck next Thank week. You. We appreciate your time. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Appreciate Legend. it. Thanks, mate.